Well, good morning, everyone. You're all very welcome to our morning service, and happy Mother's Day to all those mums among us. Um, we're going to start our service with our first hymn, um, and we'll stand to sing the words of this hymn, O four thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glory of my King, God and King, the triumphs of His grace, and we'll stand to sing these words together. We're just going to read from Proverbs 31 and verse 10. Um, these are very well-known verses. And in my Bible, it's titled, The Woman Who Fears the Lord. Proverbs 31 and verse 10. An excellent wife, who can find? She is far, from, she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. And I was just sort of thinking about Mother's Day, and these verses, they're often um, cited as verses to be looking at whenever you're looking for a wife, but uh, they very much also can describe a great mother. Um, and I know many of us have, have great godly mothers, and we're very thankful to the Lord for that. And uh, in particular, um, as it says um, there, that the fear of the Lord, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And it's so true, we can be, those that, of us that have um, 
Christian mothers, those who brought us up in God's way, we have so much to be thankful for um, that we have had mothers who feared the Lord and have taught us um, about the Lord. Um, and it's also these verses are a challenge, not to um, women, but also to men, um, how we can live and how we should be uh, living and how we should be fearing the Lord and how important that is in our lives. Um, so we'll just uh, have a time of uh, prayer now. Lord, we, we just thank you uh, for our mothers, Lord. We thank you for all that they've done for us, Lord. We thank you how they've cared for us, Lord, and for how you, they've been with us and helped us through good times and hard times, Lord. And Lord, we, we just thank you even for those of us who've had uh, Christian mothers, Lord, and the blessing that has been to us, Lord, and how they've brought us up in your ways, Lord. And we just praise you for that, Lord. And Lord, we, we, we just thank two of those um, today who maybe are... It's a day of sadness as they, they think of mothers who they've lost, Lord, or uh, grandmothers that they've lost, Lord. And we just pray even today it would be a comfort to those, Lord, where today maybe is tinged with a bit of sadness, Lord. And Lord, just pray that they would know your peace even, uh, even this morning, Lord. Lord, we, we just pray that you would just give us a great um, and holy fear of you, Lord, and we just, uh, just live our lives uh, in uh, just even as these verses are so challenging to us on how uh, we should live, Lord, just help us to live lives that bring glory to you, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that you just help us to uh, just uh, love others, Lord, and uh, fear you and love you above all things, Lord. Lord, we, we just thank you that we can gather um, this Sunday morning in your presence, Lord, and we thank you that you are here with us, Lord. We thank you uh, just uh, for another Sunday, Lord, and for a day of rest, Lord, and a day that we, we can gather together and worship you, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that you'd be with us this morning, Lord. We just pray that your uh, presence would be felt here this morning, Lord. We pray that you'd just be with Josh, Lord. We just pray that you'd uh, just give him the words to say, Lord, and just speak through him, Lord, and just challenge our hearts this morning, Lord. Lord, we pray for uh, junior church, Lord. We just pray for all those taking part in that, Lord. We just pray that you just speak to the children through that, Lord, and pray for Mike as he takes the children's talk too, Lord. Just give him the words to say, Lord. And Lord, uh, we just thank you uh, for his willingness uh, to take the children's talk too, Lord. Lord, we just pray for those in our fellowship that are going through times of difficulty at this time, Lord. We pray for those who are uh, waiting on test results, Lord, who have uh, had different health issues in uh, recent times, Lord, and Lord, maybe um, there's maybe still a lot of unknowns, Lord. We just pray that you would just be with them, Lord, and just help them, Lord. We uh, pray for Brian even, Lord. We just help, pray that you'd help him uh, recover from uh, this uh, knock to the head, Lord, and Lord, just pray that you'd be with him and for uh, others in our fellowship that have had health issues in recent days, Lord. Lord, we just thank you that we can uh, bring those that are suffering to you, Lord, in our prayers, Lord, and we just thank you for the gift of prayer, Lord, and we just praise you that you listen and answer prayer, Lord. Lord, we just uh, pray for the rest of this service, Lord, we just pray that you be glorified for all that's said and done, Lord, we just pray for uh, the, the hymns, Lord, we thank you for, again, for uh, music, Lord, and for uh, being able to sing these hymns unto you, Lord, and we just pray that you just even give us the right attitude of heart as we sing these hymns, Lord. We pray that we would really mean the words, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you'd be glorified for all that's said and done this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we are going to now have our choir. So uh, choir are going to uh, share a song with us now. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, now Mike is going to come and give us our children's talk. Thanks, Mike. Well, good morning, everyone. We have been thinking a wee bit already this morning about Mother's Day, and I feel a wee bit of pressure here because I think the last time I was in children's talk, it was Valentine's Day, and we had to talk lots about presents. And here we are again, and we're thinking about Mother's Day, and there's more pressure to sort out presents. So I was wondering this morning, did anybody do anything nice for anyone in their house? Can I have hands up, boys and girls, if any of you brought someone breakfast in bed this morning? Was there any breakfasts in bed going on? Quite a lot of breakfasts in bed going on this morning. Okay, did anybody buy anyone a present for this morning? Hands up if you got someone a present. It's all the same hands going up again. Were there any sweeties given out this morning? Yes, fantastic. Right, lots of presents for mums this morning. So we've been thinking a little bit about mums and grannies. And John read a little um, chapter to us this morning as we started from the book of Proverbs, which is all about godly women, godly wives and godly mothers and godly grannies. And there's a lot of those here this morning. And that chapter told us a little bit about what a godly woman looks like. And it tells us about how godly mums and godly wives and godly grannies, they look after us and they care for us and they make sure that we're okay and they give us everything that, we're, that we need and they're always there for us. And then that chapter finished by saying that we're to, we're to praise women who are like that. We're, it says at the bottom, we're to give them credit for all that they do. And that's maybe what Mother's Day is for. It's our chance to say thank you to our mums and our grannies who do all of these things for us. And I'm sure that this morning you can think of lots of things that mums and grannies do for you. I know what it's like in my house, but if I have the kids in the house by myself and somebody falls and cuts their knee, it's okay for daddy to give a plaster, but if mummy's there, it has to be mummy that gives the plaster. And everybody goes running to mummy if they've got a sore knee or a sore elbow, they go straight to mummy. And it's okay if mummy's going to work early for daddy to sort out school uniforms, but if mummy's there, it's maybe better that she sorts out the school uniform because she knows where everything is, and she knows who has PE that day, and she knows who has flute practice that day, and who's going to go to piano, and who's got after schools club, and she knows all of these things that sometimes I'm not so good at remembering, and so mummy looks after everyone for that. And if I go to pick up someone from school, Tommy, Tommy's the one for this. If I go pick up Tommy after school, the first thing he always says to me is, where's mummy? Because really, mummy should have been doing pickup, he thinks. And mummy's better at packed lunches because she knows who likes ham and cheese and who just likes ham. And sometimes I forget these things and get it all mixed up. And if someone is worried in our house, it's really mummy that they want to go to. It's mummy that they want to talk to. And so we have to say thank you to our mummies and our grannies because they look after us. They know all the things that we like and all the things that we don't like, and they care for us, and they're always there for us whenever, whenever we need them. And there's lots of places we can go to in the Bible that talk about mums and grannies and godly women. But I just want to tell you this morning, very quickly, about a chapter in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 49. And the whole of Isaiah is actually looking forward to the day that Jesus comes. Isaiah was a prophet. And that means that God gave messages to Isaiah, and he was to take these messages to the people. In an Isaiah chapter 49, he's telling the people all about Jesus, all about the Savior who has been promised, all about what it's going to be like whenever Jesus comes to the earth. And he's telling the people all about this Savior that has been promised. And he's telling the people that God hasn't forgotten because God had promised to send a savior and the people were waiting for a savior. And in Isaiah chapter 49, Isaiah is telling the people, God hasn't forgotten. He's going to send a savior. He's going to send a Messiah. And he tells them all about what this Messiah is going to be like. And at the end of the chapter, Isaiah says this. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget yet I will not forget you. Now we've said there this morning, aren't mums and grannies great? Because they give us everything that we need and they care for us and they never forget us. And that's kind of what Isaiah is getting at here. He's saying, can a mummy forget their child? 
Because mummies don't really forget their children. Can a mummy forget their child? Because mummies aren't really supposed to forget their children. But what he's saying is, well, they could. It would be possible for a mum to forget something about their child. It would be possible. They shouldn't, but it would be possible. But even if a mum was to forget their child, God won't. God will never forget us. And that's the message here from God, that mums and grannies are great and they care for us and they give us everything that that we need, but they could forget. And God will never forget. And so Isaiah tells the people from God, I will never forget you. I have written your name on the palm of of my hand. And if you're a child of God this morning, If you're a Christian and you've asked God to take away your sins, the Bible tells us that he will never, ever forget us because he has our names written on our hands. And he did send that Messiah. He sent that Messiah hundreds of years later because he didn't forget. He didn't forget to keep that promise. He sent his Messiah into the world, his own son, to die on the cross so we could have our sins taken away. And so this morning we can thank our mums and we can thank our grannies and we can remember that our mums and our grannies all look after us and are all with us all of the time. But if our mums ever were to forget us, we know that God never will because he kept that promise and he sent his own son so that we could have our sins taken away. So we thank our mums and our grannies this morning, but we thank God as well for keeping his promises and for promising that he will never forget us. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we're now going to have our announcements. So first of all, I just want to welcome Josh and Rosie. It's great to have you with us, and we look forward, Josh, to what you have to share with us uh, later on this morning. Um, this evening, we have Mr. Aaron Kirkpatrick from uh, Randallstown Presbyterian. Um, oh, if you have your announcement sheets, we're just going through the announcements on those. Um, on Tuesday at half 10 is Mums and Tots, and then Wednesday at 8 p.m. we have our Bible study and prayer time. Thursday at 10 a.m. is our morning prayer time, and then on Friday we have our junior and senior pathfinders at 7 and straight youth at 8.15. Uh, next Sunday we have our Sunday school at 10.15 and also our Sunday fellowship. So uh, try and if you can make it out at all to that, that would be great to see you there um, next Sunday morning. Then in the morning and evening services, we are having Pastor Val English uh, from Port Stewart Baptist taking both services. Um, As we look ahead, just a few dates for your diary. So on Saturday, the 1st of April, we hope to hold a quiz night in the church. Um, So there will be more details of that to follow next week. Uh, So just keep that in mind. And then if you're free on Saturday, the 15th of April, um, we're planning to have a clean up around the manse. Um, so that will be from 10 to 1 p.m. So if you are free on Saturday, the 15th of April, it would be great to have you along to help with that uh, cleanup on, at the manse. Um, just a few other announcements. We had our members meeting um, on Tuesday, and there's a financial report from that, and they're available at the back if you want to take one of those. Um, and um, another small announcement is that we have these... Um, missionary bookmarks. Uh, so I'm not sure who, uh, I think Hugh made these, so thanks very much for doing that, Hugh. It's just great to have a wee bookmark that we can put in our Bible, and it mentions all our missionaries, um, and we can be praying for all those, and maybe when we have those in our Bibles, that'll help us to remember to pray for them uh, more often. So just take a wee uh, bookmark there at the back too, uh, just to help us remember uh, to pray for our missionaries. Um, I think those are all the announcements. We're going to sing our second hymn, um, and then after this, Josh is going to take over. So um, we're going to stand and sing the words of the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie down, or he makes me down to lie in pastures green. He leadeth me the quiet waters by. And we'll stand and sing these words together. <laughs>
I forgot to mention, um, we ran out of prayer letters um, last week from Andrew Mabin and from Nigel and Ruth, so there's uh, a few extra copies there. So if you didn't get a copy last week, uh, there's some more prayer letters down at the, the back table. Thank you, Josh. Well, it is great to be here this morning, um, and thanks for the invite to come along just to share uh, from God's Word with you. I think since I was last here, it was probably around, I think, two years ago, so a fair bit has happened. I had just started, or I think I maybe just finished my first year of uh, college at the Irish Baptist College, and, um, and now I've only got three weeks to go, so it's a bit nerve-wracking. Um, and also in that time, I got married as well, so Rosie, my wife, is here. And uh, yeah, we just want to thank you for all your prayers for myself at college and maybe the other uh, students at the Irish Baptist College and for our family as well over the years. We just want to thank you and it's great to be here with you again. If you have a Bible with you, can I encourage you to turn to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8 and we're going to read the first uh, 17 verses. So the first book in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew and we'll read um, from in chapter 8 from verse 1 through uh, to verse 17. So this is what God's word says. When he, that's Jesus, when he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him, and behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is laying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say a word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who follow him, truly, I tell you, with, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at, uh, at that table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, into the place uh, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. And we trust God will bless the reading of his word. Just a short prayer before we come uh, to look at this. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again uh, for this day. We thank you for all of your goodness and all of your blessing to us, Father. And Lord, we pray now as we come to study your word that, Father, you would speak to us. Lord, we know it was written thousands of years ago, but Lord, you're still speaking today through your word. And so, Father, we would ask this morning you'd help us to understand what you're saying. And Lord, by your spirit, would you help us uh, to live it out. Would you cause no distractions to come into our mind? Would you help us to hear what you are saying? And Father, we're looking to you, giving you all the glory in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know if many of you use the Our Daily Bread uh, devotional booklet in the morning or evening, but on January the 6th, uh, 1993, so that is a long time ago, uh, they published this story. 
So there was a renowned artist called Paul Gustave Dor, who I'm sure a lot of you know and have his paintings, no doubt. But he lived around the, the 19th century. And he was traveling across Europe, but he lost his passport. When he came to the border crossing, he tried to explain this predicament to one of the guards. Um, and he gave his name to the official, but the guard was having none of it. He said, there's loads of people that come through this passport check-in, and they, they're claiming to be somebody but they're not really the person who they're claiming to be. But Dor insisted that he was who he was, who he was claiming to be. So the official says, all right, I'll give you a test, and if you pass this test, you can, uh, you can, you can go on through onto your, onto your flight or onto your train or whatever. So the guard hands him a pencil, and he hands him a bit of paper. And he says, do you see those people standing over there? I want you to draw a picture of them. So this is the test. He says he's an artist. Can he draw these people over there? And Dor takes the pen and quickly and skillfully starts drawing. And within a matter of minutes, he hands it back to the guard. And there is a wonderful picture of these three people just exactly as they are. And the guard lets him through. From his work, it confirmed his word. And what, as we're going to see today with, uh, with Jesus in the story, he's claiming to be the Son of God. He's claiming to be from heaven. He's claiming to, uh, to teach with authority and to, to have authority. But we, only, we really see his authority through his actions. Yes, he has said that he is God's Son, and yes, he is teaching with authority. But now we see that his work confirms his word. And Jesus' authority that he is showing us here, it's not tyrannical, it's not angry, it's not oppressive, but we see that Jesus is loving and compassionate and that he cares for each and every one of us. So Matthew in his gospel account, he, he has, every author of, the, of, a, of a Bible book has an aim. And so Matthew has an aim and he is wanting to show Jewish people who will be reading this, this account of the gospel. And he wants to show them that Jesus really is who he says he is. He really is the promised one from the Old Testament. He really is the Messiah. He really is the one that God promised would come right from the start of time. He really is God himself, the one who would take away all of our sin uh, by dying on the cross if we would trust in him. And in proving that Jesus is the promised Messiah, uh, John MacArthur, he helpfully quotes, you'll probably not be able to wrap your mind around this, it took me a while, but he says, Matthew demonstrated his legal qualification through his genealogy in chapter 1, his prophetic qualification through his birth narrative, which we read in chapter 1 and 2, his divine qualification uh, through the Father's word at the baptism, which was, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, his spiritual qualification through resisting the temptations of the devil in the wilderness, and his theological qualifications through the Sermon on the Mount. So you've all got that, all right, I'm sure. But Matthew is just building up a, a, a rack of evidence here, showing the Jewish readers that Jesus really is the Savior of the world. He really is who he claims to be. His work will confirm his word. In chapters 5 to 7, just before our reading, Jesus is teaching his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount. He's teaching them, his people, about anger and not to be angry and about lustful thoughts and that we shouldn't be lustful and we shouldn't judge others and we should love our enemies and he's teaching them how to pray amongst lots of other things. But at the conclusion of the sermon, we read at the end of, verse, at the end of chapter 7, that it doesn't say anything about the, what the disciples thought, but the Jewish people that were looking on. We read there that, they, that when he finished his sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching as one who had authority. The Jewish people are recognizing this guy is not teaching like the Jewish leaders are teaching. There's something different about it. And Matthew goes on to show it's not, Jesus isn't just claiming to be the Christ, the Son of God, and how he teaches, but he's doing so by what he does. So in these verses that we read, we see three healings. Jesus has healed before. We read that at the end of Matthew chapter 4. The Sermon on the Mount interjects, and then he goes again through the towns and through the villages, healing and teaching. So we pick up the story as Jesus is coming down the mountain from teaching the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone is following him because no one has taught like this before. And as he comes down the, modern, uh, down the mountain, we see the first of these healings, which is 
the leper who comes to him. He comes down the mountain, great crowds are following him, and behold, a leper came and knelt before him. The word leper there, it really means scaly. So it's some sort of skin condition. We don't know exactly what it is, but it is most likely what we call leprosy today. Something that's very contagious and something that is really unhealable back then, and it would lead to death. And so these people who were lepers were seen as unclean by the Jewish leaders. So if you had something that broke out on your skin, you weren't sure what it was. You would take it to the priests or to the religious leaders. They would look at you and they would say, right, uh, go out uh, and have 14 days by yourself. And if it doesn't get any better, well, then you're pronounced unclean. If you're pronounced unclean, you're banished from the city. You're not able to touch anyone. No one is allowed to touch you. You actually have to, you had to stand six feet away from uh, everybody. And if it was windy, you had to stand 150 feet away. So in Northern Ireland, you were 150 feet away. Um, you were no longer a part of society. You were cut out completely. But the leper breaks all of these rules and he runs up to Jesus and he kneels before him. He recognizes that Jesus can do something about his condition. He doesn't question Jesus' ability to heal. He does seem to question his willingness to heal, but he knows Jesus has authority to heal. And Jesus, in his love and in his mercy, responds and says that he will make him clean. And immediately, he is healed. A disease that was deemed incurable, contracting it was really a life sentence. And yet Jesus, with a word and with a touch, is able to heal him instantly. That is the authority that Jesus has. And Jesus sends him away to show the priests, and if he's found to be clean, which he was, he receives back his life, he receives back his status, he receives back his citizenship, he receives back his respect, he receives back everything, all from an encounter with the Lord Jesus. He tells the leper not to say anything to anybody, because, and that was a common occurrence you'll read throughout the Gospels. Because Jesus isn't seeking fame. He's not seeking uh, status. He's not seeking uh, to be a, a, a leader in a political way. But he's come just to save people from their sin, to live a perfect life, to show that he is the Savior. And so he says, don't go and say what has happened. So then secondly, we see Jesus entering Capernaum. It's probably on the same day. And a centurion runs up to him. So this is a Roman soldier who is in command of a hundred other Roman soldiers. And, uh, and, he, and um, they, they're under his command. And we read in verse 9 that he recognizes that he is a man himself with authority. He is the go-to person if there's trouble in the area. He can command a hundred men to do whatever he wants of them with no questions asked. And yet we see his humility because he comes before Jesus. The word used for appealing there in verse 5, it really means to beg. A guy who has a hundred guys under him, he's the go-to fella. He comes to Jesus and he begs and he pleads. And uh, he too recognizes that Jesus can do something about his situation. Luke tells us that the centurion didn't actually come himself, but he sent Jewish delegates to plead his case before Jesus. He heard of Jesus, but he feels unworthy himself to come. And then he tells Jesus in verse 6 what the problem is. He has a servant lying at home who is paralyzed, suffering terribly. We don't know what the cause of that is. But imminent death is implied unless Jesus does something about it. And Jesus says to him, I will come and heal him. And I would assume at that point the centurion or the, the delegates in his place are like, great, yes, come on. But the, the, the guys say to Jesus, He say, the the centurion says, you're unworthy to come into my house. Luke tells us that um, that, he thinks Jesus is is too important to come into my humble home. And he knows that Jesus doesn't have to be there to heal him. But that he just has to say a word and the servant will be healed. This man has an authority. Uh, this, this, This man has an understanding of what kind of authority Jesus has. He recognizes Jesus doesn't have to be there. He recognizes Jesus just has to say a word and he will be healed. This man has faith. 
All right, Jesus says that to him there in verse 10. No one in Israel, I haven't seen anybody in Israel who has had such faith as this. This man is trusting in Jesus for something that hasn't even happened yet. And he's fully convinced it will happen. And then Jesus in verses 11 and 12 explains that to enter heaven, it's not a matter of being born a Jew and born in the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not about where you're born or what you can do. It's about having faith in God, trusting in God. And that alone. And because of the centurion's faith in Jesus, the servant was healed immediately. Thirdly then, we see Jesus entering the house of Simon Peter. And it's probably Andrew's house as well. And most of the the teaching and ministry Jesus does comes out of Capernaum. And so they do sort of reckon this is like a home. This is Jesus' home as well. But he enters and he sees Peter's mother-in-law lying down sick with a fever. This fever is not a slight temperature with a wee headache. Luke 4 tells us that, there, that his mother-in-law has, Peter's mother-in-law has a high fever. This lady's life is hanging in the balance. And Mark tells us that, the, the Gospel of Mark tells us that those in the house came to Jesus and told him about the situation. And Jesus just touches her and she is healed. The fever leaves her. I'm not sure if you've ever had a fever or not. But I don't think I've ever had a severe fever, but I was looking online, and the NHS website says, if you have a mild fever, it'll take two days to get over. If you have a serious fever, it'll take a week to get over. But Jesus just touches her with his hand, and she is made well immediately, and we read, she gets up and serves him. She immediately feels well enough to get up and to start work. And then Matthew concludes this section Just with those, uh, in verse 17, those words from Isaiah 53, that well-known chapter where Jesus says that he, or the Bible says that, um, talking about Jesus, he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. That's the chapter, but verse 4 says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And rather than quote it directly, he, Matthew's translating it to suggest Jesus is, yes, our, our spiritual healer. Yes, he forgives us of our sin. But when he comes and he lives on earth as the Messiah would do, we'll see him heal physically. And that's what Jesus does. Again, Matthew's showing Jesus' authority as the Son of God. So that is me just explaining what's going on there. But I want us to think about what is Matthew wanting his readers to understand from this? What does he want us today to understand from this? From these three healing incidences. Well, there's just three things. Firstly, I think Matthew wants us to understand that Jesus' authority is divine. Jesus' authority is divine. By divine, we mean only God could have this authority. It's it's an authority that's over and above any other kind of authority. There is no situation that is beyond him. And I don't think it's a coincidence here that Matthew puts these healing incidences uh, together one after the other. The gospel writers, they they don't change what Jesus did, but they order it so that it 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 comes to a, a point. And I think Matthew has put these three healings together. As we see, Jesus heals a man with leprosy that affects the skin. He heals a servant who has, uh, who is suffering paralysis, that's muscle and bone. And then there's a lady with a fever and that's infection in the blood. You see the whole, the whole picture here of the whole human body showing Jesus has complete authority over illness. Just highlighting Jesus' complete authority. Jesus is not only able to heal some stuff and not other stuff. He has complete divine authority over every situation. I want to encourage you this morning that there is no situation in your life that you're facing right now that Jesus does not have authority over. He has complete authority, no matter what we're going through. Our God has complete divine authority over everything that we face. You may be suffering with your physical needs. You may have an upcoming trip to the doctor or a, a health checkup or scan results. You're waiting on them to come back. Over those things, God has complete authority. It may be His will to heal you of those things. But if He wants you to go through it, He still has complete authority over it. Maybe uh, you're worried about your children at school. 
Maybe you're worried about their academic ability. Maybe you're worried about someone bullying them. Maybe you're worried about what they're going to turn out like. Listen, God has complete authority. There may be a family member, a friend, a neighbor, somebody who's heard the gospel a thousand times, could explain it better than you can, but they've never become a Christian. And it's depressing, and it's, it's hard to understand why. You start to feel like there's no point in praying anymore. There's no point in inviting them to stuff anymore. Listen, our God has complete authority even over that situation. There is nothing that we face that God does not have authority over. That should bring us peace. That should bring us rest. That should be a, uh, bring us comfort. Yes, even while these things are, are going on and it's hard to, to get our head around them. But even while they're raging on, our Heavenly Father... Our God uh, is in complete authority. But it's not only a comfort to us to know that God is in complete authority, but it should also compel us to take our problems straight to Him. For the leper, the servant, uh, Peter, mo Peter's mother-in-law, only God could heal these people. They could try a healer. They could try a doctor. They could try this medication, that medication. But only Jesus could step in and heal them in an instant. I know in myself, and I'm sure it's the same with some of you, we bear our own burdens and our own weights and we, we, our, our own struggles in life. We bear them ourselves for as long as we can. Seeking, uh, seeking to, to try everything at our disposal to get through this struggle. Listen, if we take it to Jesus, He has complete authority and He has complete control. And he can deal with the situations you and I can't even think about dealing with. So often we bear our burdens ourselves, but we should take them to Jesus. Like a, like a car that develops a new rattle or a new bang, and we know we should take it to the mechanic and it will get sorted. But we just drive on and we just sort of hope it will fix itself. Maybe that's just me and my brother that do that, but maybe it's you as well. But we think, oh, if we carry on, it will be fine. It will sort itself out. But if we take it to Jesus, He has authority, and He can give us the comfort and the peace and the strength and whatever we need to get through it. Maybe we're facing a sort of a fork in the road about our career path or, or about decisions in our business or decisions about which ministries we should be involved in in the church or how the, the ministries in the church should be run. We can try and weigh this up on our own mind and try and sort it ourselves. But let's take it to Jesus, because He alone has authority. Like the old song says, let's take it to the Lord in prayer. It ought to be our first port of call. So not only is Jesus' authority divine that we read from this passage, but also Jesus' authority is compassionate. Unlike the religious rulers of the day, Jesus did not abuse his authority that he had. But we see him working, interacting, and loving and caring for people with wonderful Wonderful compassion. I heard this story, and it's a really silly story, but I heard it the other day, and it kind of illustrates the point I'm trying to make. So I was listening to the radio, and I heard about a captain of a Navy ship. And he woke up one morning, and he's like myself. He's not really a morning person. And he sits down at breakfast, and he's still kind of half asleep. And, uh, and the sun is just rising through, uh, just, just rising, and it comes through the, the window in the cafeteria in the ship. And it is just blaring into his eyes. He, he's only half awake, but he just can't open his eyes. It's so bright. And so um, he, uh, he, he lifts up his, uh, being so bleary-eyed and sleepy, he lifts up his radio and he contacts the bridge. And there's just a few mumbled words. There's other guys watching this. And there's just a few mumbled words. They don't really know what's going on. Then he gets back to his food. But slowly and surely, as he continues to eat, the ship starts to turn. And as it turns, the guys are looking and the sun is just slowly going off the captain's face. And one onlooker stated, but one onlooker stated, he literally redirected thousands of tons of steel, hundreds of people, so he could get the sun out of his eyes while he ate his bagel. But even in this ridiculous story, we get the idea that many use their position and their authority for themselves. That's what the religious leaders were doing. They were using it for themselves. They were, they, were, they were putting themselves on a pedestal and everyone else was useless. But with Jesus' authority, we see his compassion and his love 
for people. I find it so interesting just studying these four people that are kind of involved in this story. A leper, a Roman soldier, a servant, and a woman. If you were a Jewish religious leader, in Jesus' day, there was four types of people that you don't want to have, to have any dealings with. You're not interested. They're lower than you. They're lepers, Romans, servants, and women. Sorry, women. I don't think there was Mother's Day back then. All right, They, they were classed as the lowest of the low. And yet here we see God himself, the Lord Jesus, spending time with these people, interacting with them, caring for them, and worst of all, healing them. If you were a Jewish leader, that's what you would think. But Jesus' compassion extends even to the lowest person. You may feel today, and others may not know this, but you may feel like you're insignificant. You may feel like nobody cares for you. You may feel that, uh, 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 like, would it even matter if I wasn't here? Let me, to tell, let me tell you today, Jesus cares for you. Jesus loves you. Jesus has time for you. He is interested in you, even if you think you are worth nothing. Jesus doesn't spend all his time with rich people, proper people, people who are put together. Not that there's anything wrong with any of that. But he spends his time with the poor, with the weak with the ill, with the disease, with the low, with the depressed. He cares so much that he would leave heaven, the perfect glory and splendor of heaven, to come down to earth, to suffer like you and like me, and suffer even worse than some of us will ever suffer. That's how much he cares for people who are low, downcast, depressed, feel they're insignificant. He has wonderful compassion for each and every one of us. But not only is Jesus' authority divine, and not only is Jesus' authority uh, compassionate, but thirdly and finally, as we close, Jesus' authority is available. Probably one of the greatest attributes of a mom is their availability. No matter where you are, no matter what's happened, good mothers always seem to be, you know, ready to do whatever it takes to resolve the situation. They, they're happy to be available. They'll go where you need to be, where you are, and they'll go and help you. Sometimes if you ring your dad, you just get an earful, so you ring your mom instead. All right? But moms are seeking to be available. Jesus isn't some far-off, distant authority that doesn't really care. He is available for you and for me each and every part of each and every day. All these people in this story had to do was ask them to help him. The leper states, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. The centurion says, Lord, if you say a word, my servant will be healed. Mark 1.30 tells us that those in the house told Jesus of the situation with Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus is not cryptic and, and secretive and unwilling to help us. He's willing to help us. His authority is available. We just have to ask. In Matthew 7, 7 to 11, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is telling his disciples uh, just uh, about, uh, he's talking really about prayer. And he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. The one who seeks, knocks. Uh, The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if he has a son who asks him for bread, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven Give good things to those who ask him. Jesus is telling his disciples, there is somebody, there is a God, there is, there is a, a loving God who is available to help you in the moment you need it if you would ask him. He's willing and seeking to bless his children, not just even meeting their needs, but abundantly above all we can ask and imagine if we would just ask him. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. You don't know what it is to have a relationship with Jesus. You don't know what it is to, to, to know the Holy Spirit living within you and, and Him directing your life. Maybe you're, you don't know what it is to have peace with God, know your sins forgiven, get rid of that burden and that weight that hangs around us, and to fill that void that life just cannot satisfy. All we have to do is to ask our wonderful Savior, to forgive us of our sin, to come and help us. And he is an authority that is far above all we can think and imagine that is available for us. He is a complete, 
divine available authority available to us if we would just ask. With our God, every single person who would call out to Jesus seeking healing from sin, from their shame, from their guilt, from the wrong things that they've done, the Bible tells us he heals us every time. That's the reason he came to earth. This sin problem, this inability in us to do what is right all the time. He came to provide a way for us to be forgiven, to be cleansed, to have a relationship with him, with the God who made everything, the whole universe, and all that is in it. Our sin is this illness and this disease that we cannot cleanse ourselves. But if we would ask him, he has a complete divine available, compassionate authority ready for us. 1 Peter 2, 24 is a wonderful verse. And it says, He himself, speaking of Jesus, bore our sins on, the, on his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Jesus came to die on a cross, not because he deserved it and had sin of his own, but that he would take our sin upon him and we would receive his righteousness so that whenever we stand before the Father on judgment day, when he looks at us, he doesn't just see our sin, but he sees the righteousness of Christ in us. He stepped down from heaven to take upon himself our wrong, our sin, our guilt, our shame, all of our wrong. And yes, I believe Jesus by his Spirit can still physically heal if he wills. But for everybody who would call on Jesus to forgive them of their spiritual need, their sin, he cleanses us every time. As the, as the, the leper's uh, spots disappeared, when Jesus healed him, so our sin and our guilt and our deserved punishment disappears. As the servant's arms and legs and bones and muscles receive new power, so Jesus gives us new power by his Holy Spirit, helping us to live for him. And as Peter's mother-in-law is raised up and served, so Jesus calls each and every one of us to serve him. He indeed has taken our illnesses and our diseases upon himself and given us new life. Just as we close, not only did Jesus teach with authority, but he acted with authority. His, his works backed up what he said. An authority that isn't just all-powerful, but it's compassionate, caring, and loving, and is available to all who would call out to him. He has a complete authority over everything, and yet he cares for the poor, for the lepers, for the women, for the single mom, for those struggling with depression, for those who don't know how to pay their energy bills, for those who are bereaved, for those struggling in school. He has complete authority over everything. If you're a Christian, I want you to leave encouraged. Jesus has an available, complete, divine authority, and he is willing to help us in every situation, no matter what we face, no matter what we're going through. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, then he loves you and he cares for you so much that he died on a cross and he rose again defeating death and he can be your healer and your Savior if you would place your trust in him. He alone has taken our illnesses and diseases. That's what he did on the cross. He took our sin and our shame upon himself. He is all authority. He alone could do that. What a wonderful Savior we have. Let's just pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, who came from the splendor and glory of heaven to live amongst us, to suffer and to die not for anything he had done, but just because of his love and his care, taking our sin and our shame upon him. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we do not need to work our way to heaven, but, Lord, we just have to ask, and your, Lord, your complete, divine, available authority covers our sin. And, Father, I just thank you for your love and for your mercy and for your compassion and for your faithfulness that is new every morning. And Lord, will we leave this place making sure we have made use of the available authority to have our sins forgiven. And Lord, would we remember that in every situation, 
to look to you because you have all authority. Lord, we worship you and we praise you and we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we will sing our, uh, our closing song, There is a Higher Throne Than All This World Has Known. God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. God bless. Amen.